This is the Project Management Podcast. We bring project management topics to beginners and experts. Find us on the web at www.thepmpodcast.com or send your emails to pmpodcast at gmail.com. Hello and welcome to episode number 47. I am Cornelius Fichtner. This is the Project Management Podcast for the 2nd of September 2006. Of course, in today's episode, you are going to hear part two of our interview with Tom Mokol from Tenstep, in which we explore, we continue to explore, what it means to have a scalable project management methodology. Yeah, and that brings us right to the question, should long interviews be broken up into two episodes, yes or no? If you've listened to the past couple of shows, you will have heard uh, my friendly reminder for you to please stop by at the website and vote in our poll. Many of you have done, uh, 65 in total actually, 40 of you have said yes, please break them up, and 25 have said no. And uh, in regards to the question of how long an episode should be, 22 of you have said it should be 30 to 45 minutes in length, and 23 have said it should be 20 to 30 minutes in duration. Now these polls will stay open, so feel free to continue to vote, I will keep monitoring it. But to me, the current results mean that in the future, we will cut long interviews into two episodes like we've done uh, so far. And we will definitely try and stay below 45 minutes, shooting for anywhere between 30 and 45 minutes. Today's episode is sponsored by the University of California, Irvine Extension. Better, faster, more. We hear this from our stakeholders every day. Do you have the tools to take on these demands? The University of California Irvine Extension Project Management Certificate Program can give you the knowledge to get your projects done, on time, on budget. To learn more, visit www.extension.uci.edu slash pm or call 949-824-7774 in the USA. UCI Extension is a Project Management Global Charter member. As always with our sponsor, my friendly reminder that if you want to visit them, please click on their banner that you can find at thepmpodcast.com so that they know that you found them through us. And uh, when you're on the site, you will see that there is also an early announcement up that uh, we will be scheduling the Project Management Podcast bi-weekly in November and December 2006. So there's going to be a show on November 4th and 18th, on December 2nd and 15th, and the weeks in between there won't be a show. Also, we will be on a holiday break between the 16th of December and the 7th on January, and we will resume our normal weekly schedule again on January 13th, 2007. And while you're on the website, I have received quite a few emails asking me how you listeners can support the Project Management Podcast. Well, so I decided I put up a page onto the website so that you can see clearly what you can do for us. And you'll find that in the left-hand navigation under Support Us, of course. Well, and there are uh, six bullet points, seven bullet points right there. The first one is, of course, recommend the project management podcasts to your friends and to your project management colleagues. You can visit our sponsors if you find that their services are valuable to us by clicking on their banner. Or you can visit the Google ad sponsors if you find that their products are of interest to you. You can also purchase products from our affiliates, Method 1, 2, 3 and 10 Step. Or you can purchase a book that our guests have recommended during their interviews. And finally, I have finally broken down and I have put up a link for you so that you can make a donation through PayPal or with your credit card. It's secure. So go to the support us page to find all of these. Oh, 
reminds me, I got an email today from iTunes and they have just accepted us as one of their affiliates as well. So in the future, you will also be able to buy music through us. Music? Music has absolutely nothing to do with project management. Cornelius, what are you doing? Well, many of you are using iTunes to listen to the show. So it just makes sense that you may also want to listen to music. And if you want to buy legal music, why not do it through us? This week I stumbled across two new podcasts that are project management related and I would like to give you a quick review of those today. But let us start out with a limerick. There once was a show called the Project Management Podcast, whose host possesses knowledge so vast, from your iPod or your PC, you will learn much, believe you me, and a wiser PM, you will become a fast. This limerick comes to us from Mark Perry, who is a president with BOT International. Yes, BOT International is one of our past and also future sponsors. And BOT International is also the producer of the PMO podcast. Now, they say that imitation is the sincerest form of of flattery. And when I listened to my first episode of the PMO podcast, I was chuckling away. Mark and his team have, well, <laughs> listened to the best. They have taken many of the catchphrases that you will hear in the PM podcast right here and have used them in the PMO podcast. Now, let me make it clear. I am not affiliated with the PMO podcast other than they have sponsored the show in the past and the PMO podcast is now available for you to download. They have already 18 episodes available for you. I've only been able to listen to two of those. Episode one, establishing a culture of continuous improvement and episode two, 10 project rescue tips for PMO managers, etc, etc, etc. 18 episodes, each of them between between 10 and 15 minutes. The longest is actually 22 minutes in length. Excellent audio quality, superb tips. They have a, a points memo, they have a featured story, they have a mailbag. It's really great what Mark and his uh, BOT PMO podcast team have been able to put into this uh, this show and they really get it. Instead of using the PMO podcast as a 10 minute infomercial every week and just blasting you with more and more and more information about BOT International, they just mention BOT International on the side and give you great information about PMOs, how to manage PMOs and how to become a better PMO manager. So my sincerest, sincerest thanks go out to BOT International, uh, the maker of the PMO podcast, for taking so many good ideas from our own show here and implementing them in their episodes. And of course, they end every episode with until next time. The second podcast comes to us from Primavera, Primavera Systems, I believe. They are, if you don't know them, one of the top project and portfolio management software companies. Primavera is the product that they produce. And they have actually, they have three podcasts available, but uh, only one is actually on project management. It is their Power and Energy podcast. And from the title, you can tell that it is, of course, focused on the industry, uh, power plants and energy producers. But as we all know, project management is an art it's not something that only fits into one niche. So the two episodes that are currently available, they, even though they focus on the power and energy industry, they are applicable across the board. The two episodes are establishing best practices using a PMO. This is an interview with uh, Susan Lin from the Tesoro Corporation. 
And the second episode is the value of enterprise project management. This is by Daniel Palomino. Now, the sound of the Power and Energy podcast is a little bit on the tinny side, whilst the PMO podcast that we just talked about is has an excellent sound quality. Now, the tinny, I just mean you can hear it slightly. It's not to the point where you get a headache, but if you're rather picky like I am, you will you will hear it but it's nothing that should deter you from listening to this podcast because the quality of the content is excellent the second episode the value of enterprise project management is a bit on the stiff side because daniel is is reading a script but nevertheless content good so here you go two brand new podcasts the pmo podcast and the power and energy podcast by the primavera company um as always of course with our helpful resources if you want to find out more about them go to our website where you will find these listed in the helpful resources and of course because these are two project management related podcasts we have a section in the left hand menu pm podcasts i believe it's at the very bottom of all the menus click on that and you will find them in there and now let us move on with the main section of this show, part two of our interview with Tom Mokel from 10th Step. Like last week, let me remind you that this interview was done through Skype and that there was a bit of crackling on the line. I have done my best to get rid of the crackling, but occasionally you can still hear that. It's still audible. Tom Mokal has a very illustrious career. He has worked for Eastman Kodak, Cap Gemini, Ernst & Young, the Coca-Cola Company, and GEAC Computers. He has over 17 years of experience in managing and coaching project managers and over 20 years of project management and people management experience. He is a speaker on project management, has written several books on the topics. He is the author of countless columns in project management newsletters, and he is, of course, the president of Tensteb, a company focusing on project management, methodology development, training and consulting. Tom is the principal author of the 10-step methodology, of which you will hear more just in a moment, and therefore, of course, also an expert when it comes to scalable project management methodologies, which is what this interview is all about. Enjoy it. The Project Management Podcasts Feature Interview Today with Tom Mokel, President of 10-Step Incorporated. Can you give us an overview of the 10-step methodology? What what are its cornerstones? Uh, well, good. There's a, there's a couple uh, basic philosophies or, or cornerstones. Uh, first, it's called 10-step because, in fact, there are 10 components. So that's, that's one of the, the fundamental parts of it. Um, it's, uh, the first two parts are defining the work and managing the work plan. I'm sorry, defining the work and building the work plan. The thought is, is that before you start a project, you should have defined it to know what you're doing and what the risks are and what the objectives are. And you should have a work plan or a schedule that says, says uh, generally, how are you going to deliver the project? And then once the project starts, then the next eight steps are all done throughout the project. That's managing the work plan, managing issues, managing scope, managing communication, managing risk, managing documentation. Uh, managing quality and managing metrics. There's also a built-in scalability into the process, and you, you've been asking about scalability. Our 10-step model does that two ways. First of all, for every step or every component of the methodology, uh, we have guidance for large, medium, and small projects using the same general models, but small, medium, and large. And then number two, the further out we get in our steps, the more those processes apply to your larger projects. So on your smaller to medium projects, for instance, you may only be going out in the methodology to our step five or step six. Uh, you may not have to worry about managing documentation. You may not have enough documentation generated to be able to worry about that. Uh, you may not have to do formal quality management. 
which is our step nine. Again, doesn't mean that you're not going to produce a good quality product, but formal quality management is itself a culture change, and, and uh, generally it implies that you have a, a pretty large and sophisticated project to do formal quality management and to collect the metrics, which is step 10. So that also uh, builds in the scalability. We want to make sure we're doing you know, the first four or five steps for all projects, but then the, the larger projects, the larger we get, the more we'll take advantage of those, those uh, further out steps in the process. Those are a couple of the, the fundamentals, the 10 steps, the scalability built into it, uh, and then uh, the other thing that makes it kind of unique, I think, and I guess I shouldn't say I think, we've gotten tons of feedback that the methodology seems like it's understandable for, more, for most people. Uh, whereas uh, many methodologies you read are kind of hard to get your head around, uh, it seems like that the 10-step model is written in a way that uh, people can read and really understand and say, hey, this makes a lot of sense. I can apply this on my project. You have also branched out. You also have the 10-step PMBOK, the PMO step, life cycle step, and also the support step. What are the differences between all of those? Well, our 10-step project management process was the first product we developed, but we've developed others to take advantage of other, other uh, process areas that companies need to be able to get their heads around. Uh, let me start off with portfolio step. Portfolio step is the process that you would use to build portfolios and manage portfolios in your organization. It basically takes you from the point of time when somebody has an idea up to the up to the point of actually allocating money for a project. So it takes you through uh, value proposition and business planning and putting your portfolios together and seeing how much you can work and how can you balance the portfolio ultimately to the point in time when you would when you have a project. Once you have a project, then our project management process begins, which is the 10 step model. Uh, if you're doing software development, we have a methodology for the software development life cycle, which is called life cycle step. It takes a similar methodology. It's processes, procedures, templates, best practices, training, uh, et cetera, all built around software development. It won't be as much value if you're building bridges or, or marketing campaigns. Uh, this one, that product is specifically around software development, which, which is a help to many companies. Uh, once the project is completed, then we turn over the work for software development to the support organization, and we have a model for how to set up and run a support organization called Support Step. So that series takes you basically from an idea uh, up to the project, through the project management, through the life cycle, and into the support organization. We've also got uh, two other uh, major products. One is our 10-step PMBOK model, or 10-step PB. That product has all of our 10-step content, but rather than be in our 10-step model, uh, it's all of our content is integrated into a PMBOK model. And some organizations want to follow a PMBOK model. PMBOK, uh, as you probably know, is not a methodology. Uh, and I should step back, PMBOK, the product management body of knowledge from the Project Management Institute. Uh, it, it says right in there, it says this is not a methodology. It's basically the nine knowledge areas that PMI thinks is important for project managers to understand. But many companies like to utilize it as a methodology. It's not nearly full featured enough to be a methodology, but we have integrated all of our 10-step content into the appropriate spots within the PIM box so that there's now a combination of all of our, all of our uh, processes, procedures, templates, best practices, along with the PIM box. Uh, that product is licensed from PMI, uh, and so um, you know, it's an officially uh, derivative product, they call it, uh, officially licensed from PMI. And then we have, lastly, uh, for our major product set, we have a model for setting up and running project management offices, and that's the PMO step process. So uh, if you're going to deploy project management, if you're going to deploy portfolio management, many organizations do that and support project management through a PMO, a project management office. And uh, our PMO step is basically an implementation model. It shows you how to set one up. Uh, what criteria you should use, what kind of services you should consider, but it's all customizable. It basically takes you through a generic process that when you execute it at your company uh, helps give you guidance on how you should set up the PMO 
and how you should deploy project management within your own organization. Those are the major, mm-hmm. we have tons of other stuff, but those are the six major products that we offer today. Right, and your range of products seem to cover everything that a company may need if they are planning to implement a structured project management methodology. Yes, yes. The methodology, uh, the PMO, the portfolio side, uh, those are certainly all the things that you would need. The only thing that we don't have, Cornelius, is uh, we don't develop our own tools. So um, we're not, and I I should have mentioned that earlier, uh, we're not a tools company. You know, when companies uh, or your uh, listeners, if they're thinking, you know what, we need to be better at project management, normally they don't run out and buy tools right away. They normally say, say you know what, we should it's, have a good set of processes and procedures and best practices and templates. Exactly. And that's the stuff we have. We have the methodology side. Uh, we partner with some companies that have developed tools that support the 10-step model, but we don't, we're not a software development company ourselves. Yeah, I can I can support that approach. A good project management implementation in a company is the processes and not a tool. Absolutely. Yes. Now, to wrap it up, um, let's look 10 years into the future. Where do you see project management methodologies going from here? Do you have any predictions? Well, um, first of all, you know, 10 years is a long time frame, but uh, the march of time uh, over the last 30 years has been – more and more uh, focused on delivering projects using good project management processes. So uh, 30 years ago, that was an alien concept. Uh, 20 years ago, we only did project management on our big projects. Uh, 10 years ago, it was only IT projects. But now there's a general sense that it's IT, uh, but the business people, the finance, the marketing, the sales, the manufacturing, they have their own projects. So in terms of the future, uh, this march is going to continue. It's going to be, uh, project management is going to be more uh, inbred inside of a company. Uh, all projects are going to be using good methodologies. Um, as far as the methodologies themselves, I think they'll get more and more scalable. I think there'll be more and more options. You know, we, we certainly uh, have a great methodology today, but we're not the only ones. And I think there'll be more and more options for methodology in the future as we go forward. Um, Overseas, in many parts of the world, uh, I have business partners that have our content translated and have uh, 10-step offices around the world. In many places around the world, project management's similar to where it was in the U.S. 20 years ago, 25 years ago, where you really got to explain the value and really tell them what is project management. But in 10 years, I think pretty much that's going to be a concept the whole world is going to understand. I think I don't think you'll have to have to uh, educate everybody on, on what the term means. I think I think uh, there's a general march uh, through work that we're doing and through work that other vendors are doing and through uh, work that PMI is doing. You know, they're spearheading much of this. Uh, I think there's more and more awareness that you need methodology and it's going to get uh, more and more uh, um, pervasive. That's the right word within within companies. You know, everyone's going to be doing it. I don't think in 10 years we'll be like we are today where, where uh, people are still thinking uh, we should be doing this, but uh, we're not very good at it yet. I think in the future, especially 10-year horizon, I think it'll be more of a skill that's going to be uh, taught in college, uh, and it's going to be expected when you are doing work that you're going to be using a formal methodology. All right. Thank you very much for this discussion and also for your predictions about where the methodologies are going from here. Now, are you ready for the final 10 questions, the same 10 questions that I ask every project manager who I interview here on the show? Okay. Let's give it a shot. All right. So, (laughs) number one, what was your favorite project? The, uh, my favorite project was the project that I ran at Coca-Cola to help deploy project management because it was, uh, was just interesting as heck to me. But we had a global deployment program or global deployment project to deploy project management uh, processes and methodology throughout the worldwide IT organization. And uh, I enjoyed it tremendously. I learned a bunch. Uh, I understood a lot of the needs of the people who we were dealing with. I got to travel internationally to different uh, branches of Coca-Cola. And uh, I think as I look back on my career, no question, 
that uh, and it helped springboard, of course, helped springboard me with the experience into the, uh, starting my own company. Uh, that would be my favorite project. Number two, what project would you like to have managed? Well, there's uh, there's probably uh, I think of what would be the best example. Probably a couple projects. I know at Coca Cola uh, there were there were a lot of interesting and neat projects. Uh, one of them, uh, right around the time when our global deployment project was starting for project management, the one that I said was my favorite project. Uh, I know I interviewed for the uh, for a project management position within our project within the the project implement SAP at Coca Cola, and um, I didn't get that position. Uh, now it turns out, you know, you never know about fate, but it turns out then that I took the position in our project management office, and that ended up being my favorite project. But I think, uh, you know, in terms of a project that would have liked to have managed, uh, that would certainly have been one uh, to work on a big SAP implementation. Also, being able to uh, work globally and uh, really get into a lot of uh, business understanding and business strategy and uh, understanding how the company works, that would have been a great opportunity to do that. Number three, what is your favorite project management book? Well, I'm going to cheat a little bit. Um, in fact, I have a whole bookshelf of books for project management and portfolio management and, and a lot of things that are, are of interest to my company. Uh, but I'm going to cheat because the favorite book that I have read is one that I wrote. And um, when people ask me what's the best book on project management, I don't go back to a textbook. Uh, I go back to our book called Lessons in Project Management. And I don't do that just because I bought it, or, or sorry, that I wrote it. I, I do that because uh, I think that's the best book I've seen for really explaining project management in the context of different project scenarios. Uh, we, we explain a scenario, we explain a project, we explain what's going on, and then we discuss how you can use good project management processes to help resolve problems on those. I think it's a neat concept, and uh, uh, your uh, listeners might think that I'm cheating and just promoting my own book, but uh, I'd be hard-pressed to pick another book that I liked better than that one. So I think that would be the honest answer as well. You're allowed to cheat. Number okay. four, what is the topic of the next seminar that you're planning to attend? Well, um, I think, and I don't have this scheduled yet, but if I can get the time the next few months, uh, I'd like to go to a seminar or a training class on uh, IDL, or ITIL, I -T -I -L, uh, the uh, the infrastructure library, I'm trying to think of what the, the exact uh, acronym is, uh, information Technology Infrastructure Library. Does that sound right? Uh, it's a, it's yes, a, that's it. Okay, it's a concept. If, you're, if your listeners haven't heard it, it's a, it's a concept that was uh, created over in the UK by the same people who developed the PRINCE2 methodology in, uh, in England. And uh, I've heard of it five years ago. And when I heard of it, someone said, hey, you ought to look at this. It's kind of, it's kind of interesting. And I thought, oh, yeah, it's kind of neat. But in the last couple of years, it's, it's gotten more and more popular, and uh, there's a large percentage of uh, Fortune 500 companies that are looking seriously at understanding it and, and implementing different aspects of it. It's not so much project-related, so it's a little bit off, off uh, subject. It's more having to do with the support and uh, supporting your customers and the infrastructure area, the help desk area, the, the IT, uh, IT infrastructure and how to provide uh, a very good service level uh, for those areas. Number five, what is the best way to make a project fail? Well, I, I look back at the reasons that project fail, projects fail. Uh, if your listeners have been on a project that had difficulty, um, and then if you think back afterwards and think, you know, what did we do wrong? Usually the answer is we should have spent more time planning. Uh, and that could mean we didn't spend a good enough time understanding the scope. We didn't understand the customer's uh, deliverables. We didn't understand the risks. We didn't estimate the work correctly. But generally the thought is, is many times we're, we're told here's the project and 
not necessarily even because the the customer or our manager tells us to just start running, but because we're so excited, um, the project manager, the project team, we want to just get going, and it usually ends up causing us problems. So I think the best way to make the project fail is to neglect the planning. You know, don't don't plan, don't build an initial schedule. You know, just just to get the work and start executing, like a lot of people want to do. Uh, that's to me the surest route to failure. Number six, how do you like to celebrate a successful project? Um, I like to celebrate not so much for my benefit, but for the benefit of the team members. So I like to have an end of project meeting. Uh, I like there to be a, a celebratory atmosphere uh, where everybody can celebrate the success. Uh, I'm not even necessarily saying that we're going to make a you know a big uh, celebration and invite the whole department, but the people that are associated with the project, the sponsors, your managers, uh, they should all be there. Uh, it's kind of a recognition meeting. It's a feeling of accomplishment where you can look each other, you know, look at each other from the project team and know that you've done something good. Uh, you can, uh, you know, talk about the things that went well. Uh, and really kind of pat yourself, not not you yourself, but you can pat the back of your coworkers and they'll pat your back and the project manager can uh, bask in the glory of knowing that uh, that uh, he or she helped deliver the project successfully. Certainly there can be uh, sodas there and there can be, uh, you know, uh, cake. You know, we can do some of those things too. But just, I think, uh, being able to, to, to bask in a collective glow of knowing that you did a good job and that you were successful uh, is a great way to end a project. Number seven, in your projects, where do you focus most of your attention in order to be successful? That's got to be planning in your case, right? Well, yeah, that's kind of the flip side of, uh, of what you'd do if you wanted to fail. So I'm not saying um, most of my attention over the long term, because certainly I don't want to sound like I'm, I'm going to plan everything to death. But I would certainly make sure that the work is defined, and uh, by defined I mean that we've got the objectives, the deliverable, the scope, the initial risks, make sure we know what the organization looks like for the project, et cetera. Make sure you have a good work plan. Uh, and, if you, and I think for most people, if you'll focus there and if you uh, get your customer's approval on your charter or your project definition document, uh, you can go a long way to helping the project be successful. They say that if you can set up a good plan, and if it is in fact a truly good plan that recognizes all the things that are needed to be done, that then the rest of the project is just execution. You just have to execute the plan from there if you've got a good plan to start with. So I certainly would make sure you spend the appropriate amount of attention there. Number eight, if you weren't a project manager, what would you like to be? Well. I probably wouldn't have said this five years ago, but uh, having your own business uh, gets you uh, a spirit you know, of entrepreneurship, a spirit of owning something, a spirit of building something, and uh, I find a lot of, a lot of uh, satisfaction and a lot of uh, value in that. So, um, you know, to be honest, I, I uh, write on project management and I do a lot of teaching on project management, uh, but we don't run a lot of projects in our company, right? So uh, I'm not so much really a hands-on project manager today, but if I wasn't in this field and people ask me once in a while, what if somebody buys out your company and I tell them, well, I'm not interested in selling, but if the offer of course was, was uh, huge enough, who the heck knows? But if that happened, they asked what I do and I'd say, you know what? I think I started another company. You know, so if I wasn't in the project management field today, uh, I'd be doing something, you know, to build another company of some kind. Number nine, what is the one thing that a project manager cannot live without? Um, well, I'm a, I'm a process guy. And so uh, I feel like a project manager needs to have a good set of project management processes supported by templates. And even if you don't have you know, all of the uh, techniques, even if you don't have all of the best practices, even if you don't have the, the, the best of training, even if you don't have tools, um, I think that you can go a long way with a good set of, process, of project management processes. And by that I mean scope change process, issues management process, 
quality management process and a good set of templates to support that, I think you can go a long way with that. I think uh, even if you don't have all the subject matter expertise, I think even if you aren't the greatest people person, and of course, I'm, I'm, uh, if you have our druthers, we'd be great people managers, uh, great project managers, and great subject matter experts. But uh, if we have to compromise, I think having a good uh, tool set of understanding the, the basic fundamental processes of project management, having those good processes in hand, and having some templates to support them can go a long way to help you be successful. I think it'd be hard to be a good project manager without those. Uh, those are the things that you probably can't live without. And finally, number 10, the oldest question in project management. What is more important in a project manager? Is it project management expertise or is it industry expertise? Yeah, sorry, I gave a little bit of the answer already. I should have saved it for, for this last one as well. Uh, I'm going to broaden it a little bit, uh, even though, even though uh, as you said, maybe I have some discretion here. Um, people ask me once in a while, you know, do you, need, do you need to be a great people person to be a project manager? Uh, matter of fact, I taught a class today, and this, que this exact question came up. The guy asked me, uh, what if you don't have the subject matter expertise, that they were software developers? And they said, what if you don't have software development expertise, or you don't know the Java, you know, can you be a project manager in that area? And my thought is, and I don't know if that this is universally recognized, but my thought is, if possible, we want it, you know, so we'll caveat it. It's, if possible, we want people with the right subject matter expertise, the right project management skills, and the right people management skills. But if we have to compromise, in my opinion, the project management side, understanding the, understanding the methodology and the processes for managing a project are the most important. And you can get by without the industry expertise if you have very good project management skills and if you have a team of people who do know or who do have the industry expertise. Uh, it certainly used to be the case 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, uh, we took our best salesman, made him a sales manager, made him a sales project manager. Took our best engineer, made him an engineering project manager. Took our best accountant, made them an, an accounting project manager. Took our best programmer, made them a project manager. And I think we have found that that's not the way to do it. You know, your, your industry expertise uh, doesn't cut it once the projects start to become more complex. You can't just get by with, I think I know how these things work, when you're managing the work of many, many people over a long period of time. You really need to have the fundamental project management skills. And if you're a little bit weak on the industry side, um, I think that's acceptable. I think that's the way to go. Tom, thank you very much for your time today and for having been on the program with us. Well, my pleasure. I appreciate you asking me, and I appreciate the great set of questions. Hopefully, I, I didn't uh, talk too much for your listeners, but uh, I'm excited about project management and the kind of things that are going on in the field, and it was a great opportunity to talk with you. That was part two of my discussion with Tom Mokel on scalable project management methodologies. Let me remind you that if you want to purchase the book that Tom or any of our previous guests have mentioned, then why not do it through our website? Go to thepmpodcast.com, click on the books section, and then select the book that you'd like to purchase. It takes you to Amazon, and uh, we get a small commission from your purchase, which helps us to keep our expenses a bit at bay around here. And of course, uh, we are a 10-step affiliate if you are interested in purchasing purchasing their products, same thing, click on the affiliate banner and we get a commission from you. Thank you so much. Well, and that's it for today. Thank you very much for listening. Tune in again next week for episode 48, when we will be talking with Tushara Vijarvardhana about uh, what it is like to manage a PMO in Sri Lanka. Then in episode 49, I will be welcoming Richard Larson and Elizabeth Larson from Watermark Learning. And then I really want you all to join us for episode number 50, when we will also be celebrating our one year anniversary. And we will do that with an interview with one of the greatest names in project management today, Mr. Max Weidman. 
As always, you can find us on the web at www.thepmpodcast.com or send your emails to pmpodcast at gmail.com. And when you write, please tell me where in the world you are writing from. And finally, we have this. Quantitative project management means that you will be able to predict cost and schedule overruns a lot, lot sooner. Until next time. <laughs>